Is evil real? If you just ask the question simply, what would the answer be? Yes. Of course it's real. <laughs> if it wasn't real, we wouldn't even have a, a topic to discuss. So what, what is the question, really? What's the question? Is evil real? Yeah, let's go home. What? How, do you make, how do you make this intriguing? I guess the, the reason we ask the question is, firstly, because we don't want it to be real. Secondly, we have a problem because how can a good God create real evil? I guess that's why the problem, or the question, the question is asked. So we start off right at the beginning, uh, text one. Here's the beginning of our problem. The beginning of the problem is because the Ramban says, as if, as if it even needs to be said, that where it says in the title of Omar Elikim, where it uses the name Elikim, what does that mean? There's Hashem and there's Elikim. Elikim means the source of all strength. Because the, the root of the word Elikim is Kale, and that means strong. So Elikim is the power of all powers. In other words, there is nothing outside of God's control, there's nothing outside of God's power. So the statement that some people make that God can't control the evil, he just sympathizes with those who suffer, is not acceptable. Because how can he not be in control of, how can there be a power that is not his power? So that's what sets up the problem which leaves us with one of two options. Either God is not really God, he's not the power of all powers, or he's not so nice. So we're either questioning his power or his goodness. So there was this book, which I think they quote later on, uh, a rabbi wrote this book saying that when bad things happen to good people, it's not God's fault. That's the way it is. And God is very sympathetic. So somebody wrote a, a review on the book and said, it's not really a big, a big accomplishment because he just replaced a cruel God with an impotent one. So... Maybe you can't be angry at somebody for being impotent, but it's certainly not God. Text 2. Is it possible that there are some events that are not significant enough in God's eyes to bother with? So you see, you can actually make a very good argument. People suffer all the time. Let's talk about Jews. Jews suffer all the time, and yet there are always Jews. So you see, God is not really so concerned with the individual, but he takes very good care of the collective. He will not let the Jewish people be killed. Individuals, not so important. God forbid. So maybe that's the answer. The answer is, yes, God is in control of big things, but he doesn't particularly care about the little things. But the Pasuk says, Shleim HaMelech says, Bechol mokem eine Hashem tseifes royim v'tevim. The eyes of God are everywhere observing the bad and the good. 
there is nothing overlooked or overseen. Overlooked. Rambam says in text 3, in the 13 principles of faith, the 10th principle is, you can read it yourself, the last line is the most important, for your eyes are open to all the ways of mankind to give each one according to their ways and according to the fruit of their doings. Which means everything happens with judgment. You get what you deserve. You suffer only if you must, if you deserve it. You're rewarded according to your deeds. So nothing is overlooked. So that option is also not acceptable. So here's the problem. If God watches and sees everything and judges everything and is the power of all powers, then what's going on? What's going on is evil. And the problem with that is text 4. David HaMelech says in Tehillim, Tev Hashem lakol v'racham aval kol ma'asov, tzadik Hashem b'chol d'rocho v'chosid b'chol ma'asov. He is good to everyone. His compassion is upon all the creatures. He is just in all his ways and benevolent in all his deeds. So where is the evil coming from? Text 5 and 6 also strengthen the question. Text 5 says, according to the Emek HaMelech, he says, God, in fact, created the world for the purpose of doing good, of kindness. <coughs> because it is the nature of the good to do good. So the whole purpose of creation is for goodness, and yet here we have evil. Text 6. At the end of creation, of the six days of creation, God says, Behold, it is exceedingly good. What does it mean it's good? God saw all that he had made and it was good. The trees, the grass, what does it mean it was good? It was for the good. It would all serve the purpose of goodness. So, where does the question, why do bad things happen to good people, where does this come from? What causes us to ask that question, aside, aside from the pain? And? We want justice. It's our perception of what's happening. Okay. So that's all subjective. I don't like this. I want justice. I'm. But, but there's a philosophical reason. There's a, a, an an objective cause for the question. So that we can start seeing the good and the bad. We want justice. It's, it's not just, I want justice. There has to be justice. It's not my issue. It's not personal. This is essential. God is the judge of the world. Where is the, where is the justice? So actually, if I were an atheist, I wouldn't be able to ask that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> Why not? Why not? In fact, I, I had this ongoing debate with a woman in Minnesota years and years ago. She considered herself an atheist. Actually, she was a little flighty. <laughs> she, wasn't, she wasn't intelligent enough to even be an atheist, but she loved playing the role of the atheist. And tragically, her brother, who was the patriarch of the family, passed away very young. And she was 
furious. And she kept saying, why him? He was so good. So at months after the, the, the funeral, I said to her, you know, you're giving atheism a bad name. How can you ask such a question? Why him? He was good? <laughs> what does it have to do with anything? The doctor showed you exactly where his veins or his arteries were blocked. He had a bad heart. So what if he was a good man? <laughs> what, what is that? Good men don't die? I mean, what is that? Only a believer can ask that question. Only if you believe in God, who says, I am the judge and I pay you according to your, to your deeds. And so if you're a good person, you should deserve more life, not less. So he was a good guy. So why did he die? So first of all, who are you asking? Why did he die? Were you asking me? <laughs> you're asking God. If you believe in God. Secondly, if you believe in God, then, then there's a system set up, and this is not following the system. If you don't believe in God, there's no system. What are you asking? Why do good guys die? I don't know why do bad guys die. What's the difference? Uh, another thing. Why do good people suffer? I got a better question. Why are bad people born? That doesn't bother you? <laughs> I think that's a bigger question. The good guys suffer and they become, you know, noble and we admire them. Bad guys are born. What? What's the excuse? So that we can punish them for being bad? So if you don't believe in God, you have no questions. So you can't say, oh, I want justice. <laughs> From whom? Who says there is justice? It's an accident. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> so the question actually comes out of belief in God. In fact, the more you believe in God, the greater the question. So here's an interesting thing. You can't say, if, if you want to handle the evil in the world, strengthen your faith in God. That doesn't help the more you strengthen your faith in God, the bigger the problem becomes. Like, for example, I believe in God. I, I don't believe in Hashgacha Pratis. I don't think God is paying attention to every little detail. Okay, you've solved your problem somewhat. But if you believe in Hashgacha Pratis also, the Baal Shem Tev's Hashgacha Pratis, that every little detail is by divine plan, well, not a problem is much bigger. So how does Amuna help you with, with the question of evil? So somebody who does believe will obviously be bothered more by the question rather than less. It's also possible that a non-believer will be more bothered by the problem. Why would it be worse for the non-believer? Well, first of all, the believer at least has someone to complain to. The people, the survivors of the, of the war, of the Holocaust, who hate God with a passion, at least they have somebody to hate. Well, non-believer believes in absolute order, but no justice, no goodness. So if the evil bothers him, where does he vent his, where does he vent his pain? Where does he, he's got nobody to complain to. And we know when you're suffering, the first thing you want is, to is, that, right? is someone to kvetch to. I mean, not, not even that. So, unfortunately, what happens if you're not a believer and evil things are happening, you blame yourself. I'm stupid. I made a bad mistake. I made a bad choice. I made... Or you blame the people around you. 
You blame the government, you blame the school, you blame the neighbor, because you got to vent it somewhere. <clears throat> so for a non-believer, the question is not bigger, but the pain is bigger, because you have no outlet. So when a person comes to you and says, I'm angry at God, how could he do this? I hate him, I'm not going to be from. That's a survival technique. That helps them handle the pain. So the first thing you do is you agree with them. Don't, don't defend God. He doesn't need your defense. <laughs> On the contrary, in some way, this is the strongest expression of emuna. It's enviable almost how real God is to people who hate him. We're supposed to love him. You do, you don't, a little bit, maybe, forget about it. But those who hate him, he is so real. So... <clears throat> Let's see, what, the, what does Torah say on how to handle evil? Now, we're starting off with a, with a handicap here because we don't know what evil is. We haven't defined it. What is evil? Which evil are we talking about? Pain? You hit your you hit, you hit your finger with a hammer. That's the evil we're talking about. Okay, a, a, a piano falls on your head. <laughs> Big pain. Is that is that the evil we're talking about? Maybe. Why should that happen? Well, if you know that someone did it to you, then it turns into an evil thing. Right. That's the other option. The evil of people. People's evil intentions. Well, evil it's not people. God's evil intentions. But you presume mm -hmm. God's evil intentions. Yeah. That's yeah. evil. Yes. It's causing other people's suffering. Right, so people to people. What about God to people? Mm hmm. Let's, let's even take people out of the picture. A lion eats uh, a gazelle. Is that evil? If you believe that God let that happen, then it's yes. It's evil to the, from the gazelle's point of view. But to the, to the lion, it's just lunch. Right. <laughs> yeah. So is that evil? In other words, it's not what human beings introduce. That we can almost handle. Evil people do evil things, so kill them. Put them in jail or whatever. But the question is, is nature itself evil? Is this an evilly designed world? Like, for example, the, 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 the food chain. Everybody's eating everybody. <laughs> everything is eating everything. Tsunamis, diseases, plagues. It seems like nature itself is evil. And yet we don't call it that. Nobody says that a lion eating a gazelle is evil. That's nature. Why? Because the lion has no evil intentions, he's just hungry? No, because we don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis. We know that it's a concept. If we had to watch lions eat gazelles, yeah, it would be disturbing. But also because disturbing. there is no other... Unless it's your pet lion. <laughs> <laughs> the lion doesn't have choice. Because we have the option. Kipper, right? like when, when you see the chicken being shafted, some I people do. are like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Do I really want the schnitzel right now? Yeah, but that is a food chain. It's right. But we have an option. We can eat other stuff. The lion really doesn't have an option. His teeth don't work well with grass. It's saying he'll die. Hmm. We do that with fish. We give fish worms. We actually do the actual Yeah, we hook eating. it on, don't they? <laughs> the world by design is evil. Hmm? The world we, by design. 
the world by design is evil. It seems like, right? Yeah, evil. Who can live with that? That's why we don't want to go there. Huh? Yeah, we can't we're discussing that, this. So we can't go there. And, you know, that's what I... Sure, we struggle with that every, every day. I think that the world is too evil or really evil. Too evil? How about you? Know, a little bit. <laughs> a little evil like an animal. <laughs> <laughs> if it were just a little bit evil someplace else, <laughs> right. Right. that would be okay. Yeah. But it's also perfectly designed. I feel like the evil is when it's out of that space of what the way it's designed the way we think it's designed. So it's designed that the lion eats the gazelle. It's designed that we eat chicken. But when we go and eat, if somebody goes and eat a person, that's not part of their design. So that's evil. But it's out of, that's that out my, of nature. my opinion. Yeah. Of what's not you, part you could of call it evil. You call it bad taste. <laughs> <laughs> you got poor taste in food, you know. Okay, so we haven't really defined which evil we're talking about. And, uh, well, evil is the absence of goodness. That's all. Uh, we also haven't defined what does the word real mean. Is evil real? What do you mean is it real? Does it happen? Of course it happens. We're talking about it. But is it real? What does that mean? Real is, is like the opposite of imaginary. Evil is not imaginary. That's a ridiculous question. So what does it mean? Is it real? Is it a cause? Is that its own agency? Let's, let's use, just for the purpose of, of our discussions, let's, let's, let's define real as justified. Is it justified? In other words, is there a necessary or justified reason for evil to exist? That it exists, that's a fact. But some things exist and they're not justified. In other words, we'd be better off without it. And some things exist because, because it's necessary, it's, it's good. It's, it's proper, so we don't call it evil, and, 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 and we want more of it. But then there are those things that are real in the sense that, yes, it exists, but should it? Is it really necessary? So the question really is not, is evil real? The question is, what justifies the real existence of evil? Now the question it becomes even more religious in nature. What justifies it? <laughs> Who says there's justice? Why does everything need to be justified? Only if you believe not only in the existence of a creator, but in a purpose. If the creator is a, is a purposeful creator, then you can legitimately ask, what purpose does he see in having evil exist? So what we're really asking, if we get right down to the, to the chassidish approach to the whole thing, I would like to see what he sees. Why do we learn? Why do we ask questions? Because we're curious? because it's the nature of the human mind to want to, want to fit everything into a neat little package so that it all is consistent and logical to our brain? Why do we learn? Why do we ask? Why do we probe? Why do we, why do we search? From a chassidish perspective, God is doing all this. We would like to see what he sees. We would like to enter his mind and look through his eyes because he's our God, not because we need justification. We're not putting God on trial 
that, that, that language is completely unacceptable, which they, they have a text for it. We're not judging God. We're not more righteous than God. That's, that's so unacceptable. That arrogance, that, that... I know right from wrong. What's with God? That, that's childish. What we want to do is we want to get into God's brain, into God's mind, so that we see what he sees. So the first assumption is, God created evil and, and finds it necessary, at least necessary, if not virtuous in some way. We would like to see what he sees. Not only to justify the evil, but to get closer to him. If I can see what he sees, then, then we're closer. We're on the same page. There's this beautiful explanation that the Rebbe gives. Before, before Yaakov passes away, the Torah tells us that all of a sudden, without any provocation, he, he explains to Yosef why he buried his mother on the side of the road in, 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 in Shechem rather than bury her in the family. Because, because he knew that Yosef had some hard feelings. So with his dying breath, the last thing he said to Yosef was, there was, there was a reason. What was the reason? 400 years or so from now, the Jews will be taken captive by the Babylonians, and they'll be marched down that road in chains, and to survive that Golus, they're going to need to daven at her resting place, so she is where her children are going to need her. The Rebbe's question was, Yosef had bad feelings against his father? How could that be? Yosef questioned whether his father was, was behaving properly? He doubted his father's motivations? Particularly since his father was also his Rebbe, his teacher. Doubting your Rebbe is like doubting the Shechina. So how could he have had bad feelings? So the question is a very, the question itself is, is, is a moral powerhouse. But the answer is, he didn't have bad feelings against his father. On the contrary, like we were saying before, the more you believe, the more you know for sure that everything that God does is for the good, the bigger your question is. But what is the question? The question is, knowing that this is good, why don't I see it? If I really believe it's all good, then why doesn't it look good to me? Why doesn't it feel good to me? Why doesn't it taste good to me? In other words, why am I not in the same place, headspace, as what I'm seeing? So because he trusted his father completely and knew that everything his father did was for the good and it was holy and it was right, and then he looks at his mother lying there in the middle of nowhere, and, no, no, no. I, don't, I don't see the good that I know is there. So the hard feeling wasn't against his father. The hard feeling was, why am I not in the same place? Why am I not in the same Madrega, same level as my father. So what did Yaakov do? He elevated Yosef to the level where he could see what Yaakov sees. In other words, he brought him closer. He didn't justify himself. Yosef didn't want him to justify himself. He was, like, jealous. Why don't I see what you see? So that's what we're saying. We know that everything that's happening is for the good. But now we're jealous. If it's all for the good, why am I not included? Why am I left out? Why do I look like, like, like I'm the stranger who just came to town and I don't know what's going on here?
So what does the what does the Gemara say? The Gemara in Brachis. A person is obligated, there's a mitzvah, to bless God for the bad, just as one blesses God for the good. Where does it say that in the Torah? Hmm? It says you should love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The word for might is ma'idecha. Another meaning of the word ma'idecha is whatever measure he meets out to you, be exceedingly, exceedingly grateful to him. Love him for every measure that he gives you. So the word ma'idecha comes from the word mida. Whatever mida he gives you, whether it's chesed or gvura, you should be grateful. So the Baditchever wrote a song called You in Yiddish. And he writes, he sings, everything is you. When things are good, it's you. When things are not so good, it's you. And as long as it's you, it's good. In other words, from you, I'll take anything, as long as it's coming from you. So you want to love me? I, Great. You want to hate me? Great. As long as it's you. <clears throat> Which basically means that whether God is loving you or hating you, you're in a relationship. It is so amazing that God could actually love you. That right? makes no sense whatsoever. His love is infinite. You're finite. What are you going to do with all that love? <laughs> Where are you going to put it? Like the comedian says, you can't have everything. You know why? Where are you going to put it? <laughs> you have no storage room for everything. If God loves you infinitely, what are you going to do with that love? You can't even handle it. You don't have capacity for infinite. So if he loves you, it's so strange, it's so amazing, it's so unexpected. And if he hates you, same thing. You're important enough to be hated? Since when? Some guy had this complex. <laughs> and he, 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 was, he was so upset with me, he says, every time I walk in, you walk out? That's how much you hate me? I said, I'm sorry to tell you, but I, I don't hate you, and I don't notice when you walk in or when you walk out. You're not that important. So if God does hate you, wow, you're that important? So it's almost like, love me or hate me, just, just don't ignore me. So if God loves you, you should thank him. If he hates you, you should thank him. Because it's so unexpected. <laughs> Why would you hate me? What am I to you? What do I ever do to you? <laughs> what, are you what are you hating? Just off, off the record, <clears throat> there is a condition where people and I'm, it's, it's, it's pretty common, where you feel like everything in my life goes wrong. Everything. Like, I'm always, everybody else gets by. I, some people have good luck and bad luck. I have only bad luck. Nothing goes right in my life. That, that, is, that feeling or that, that perception is actually pathological. It's an, it's an illness. It doesn't have a name yet. But, but it is. It's, it's, it's an unhealthy disturbance. It's not an opinion. It's not a, a, 
an, another perception of life. No, no. It, there's, something, there's something broken in the system. And there's actually a homeopathic remedy that takes it away. So it must be an illness because you can't cure nature. You can only cure a pathological disturbance. So if a person feels like, I get all the bad luck, it's almost like God has singled me out and is out to get me. He spends all his time thinking up ways of making me suffer. That's a complex. And it's an arrogant complex. <laughs> it doesn't humble you. It makes you more arrogant. It's me against God and God against me. He's out to get me. If he was out to get you, you'd be gone a long time ago. <laughs> it, it's a disturbance. Anyway, so let's take a look at what is the bracha you say <clears throat> when something bad happens? You have to say, Baruch Dayan HaEmes. What does that mean? Meaning? So, something bad just happened, and what are you supposed to say? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed is the true judge. What does that have to do with anything? How is that a response to the bad? I don't know why you can't just leave it out. Just don't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Don't say it. Because we there are times when you just don't want to say it. Of what, what, whatever's going on. Can't possibly understand. So there was the incident where Aaron's sons, two of his sons, died. What does the Torah say? What was, what was Aaron's reaction? Sometimes you don't have to respond. Because? moment you can't you, it's just so great that it's like you may not have seen it as bad there's no response needed you there's wanted this. to respond you yeah. couldn't mm -hmm. it was Shabbos that's only if the response is like bad like like sad not if it's he lost his two sons are you kidding yeah so why, does he, why doesn't he make a chaim it was so good it's like it's not good, it's not bad, it's just the truth of what is. This is what God wanted. Well, okay, so, so, so that's, that's, what the, that's what the bracha, whatever is, baruch dynamis. Right, so that's why, why our one response. You're accepting the fact that it's <coughs> accepting it. Though. You say that it's what? No, that it's justified, that it's right, that it's... But we don't understand it. Yeah. The one above understands it. We're not there yet. Ever. Okay, so let's, let's jump ahead. We're on seven. Let's let's jump ahead to the solution, or part of the solution. When we say bad or evil, like we were saying before, what what is the definition? What definition of evil? Unjustified. We can handle anything if we know why. If it's justified, we can handle it. Up to a point, of course, you know, but pain can, pain can drive you crazy, but... People doing evil always justify it. Like, there is a justification, they always think they're doing evil for the good. See? So... <laughs> you see? If we think we have a reason, we can, we can handle everything. Like a woman going into labor, she can handle the pain. But if she wasn't pregnant <laughs> and she was feeling that kind of pain, yeah. she wouldn't handle it. You can't. You cannot handle that kind of pain unless you know what it is. Once you know what it is, no matter how much it hurts, you can handle it. First of all, you know it's not going to last very long, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, it's only temporary. You know what the result will be. <clears throat> In fact, towards the ninth month, you're like, come on! <laughs> Where's the pain? <laughs> 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 
bring it on already. So if we know what the purpose is, it's not evil. It just hurts. Right? So what do we mean when we say bad or evil? We mean, so in, in literal practical language, it shouldn't have happened. Why is this happening? It shouldn't happen. That drives us crazy. Also for a good reason. We are designed by our Creator with a sense of purposefulness. The, the purposeless makes us crazy, in, even in tiny little things. Something is out of place. It doesn't belong there. It drives us crazy. What do you care? So there are some pens on your dining room table. It doesn't belong there. So we have a sense of propriety, a sense of rightfulness or purposefulness. Somebody says something, you say, why did you say that? Why would you say that? I don't know, I just said it. No. You can't just say it. <laughs> everything has its place, everything has its purpose. And that's why if something happens and we can't identify it or locate it in, in its, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit anywhere, it makes us crazy. Not just we object, it destroys us. We will literally crack up from it because it, it is so against our nature for things to be useless, purposeless, unjustified, which is a compliment to the human being. Of course, our, our greatest strength is also our weakness. When we can't find the justification, we fall apart. We go to pieces. So, again, definition. Why do bad things happen to good people? What's a bad thing? Anything that shouldn't happen is bad. Like the Rebbe once said, the Ebeshter is a perfect homemaker. A balabasta. Everything that belongs is there, and anything that doesn't belong is not there. That's called efficient homemaking. So whatever doesn't belong is not there. So when something happens and it doesn't belong, we go crazy. Not only because it's an injustice. Now, there doesn't have to be someone getting hurt. Anything that doesn't belong disturbs us. Why is it there? Even in science, why do human beings have remnants of a tail? Why? What do you care? It doesn't belong. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. So bad means something that should not have happened. And that's why if an old man passes away, nobody cracks up, right? But if a child, God forbid, <coughs> whoa, whoa, that shouldn't happen. Why? Death is death. What's the difference how old you are? The difference is we can justify the death of an old person. We, 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 can't, we can't find justification for it. So it shouldn't have happened. So now the question is this. If you say it shouldn't have happened, doesn't that come from your belief in God? What do you mean? It should, it shouldn't. So you believe in God, and you're saying that something that happened shouldn't have happened. Uh, that's a little contradictory. If God is the power of all powers, and nothing happens without him making it happen, what do you mean it shouldn't have happened? If he did it, then it should happen. Secondly, how do we know what should or shouldn't happen? How many times have we had the experience where something happened and we said, oh, no, 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 this is bad. Ten minutes later, so, oh, I'm sorry, changed my mind. <laughs> I guess it's really for the good. So to judge 
what should or shouldn't happen, we are completely unqualified. We don't know what happened in the past. We don't know what's going to happen 10 minutes from now. What are you judging? It should or shouldn't happen. So what is the answer to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? The answer is, bad things don't happen. How could it? You're saying this that happened should not have happened, meaning God didn't cause it. So who did? The devil? What is that? The Satan did it? That's, that's, that's idolatry. Ah, uh, okay, okay. We could blame ourselves. But in, in principle, by definition, no bad thing ever happened. Because it can't. How can something that isn't supposed to happen, happen? So the Holocaust is good? See, if, if we understand, the world did not exist. God makes it exist. So how can something happen that isn't meant to be? How can something exist without having a purpose? The only way that anything exists is because there's a purpose. Otherwise, there's nothing. So when we say God is the power of all powers, we mean he is the only creator. Nothing happens without him. So what does it mean? It shouldn't have happened. So what about the people who question God? They're not saying this shouldn't have happened. They're not doubting the purposefulness. Most people, if you give them a purpose, they're content. Oh, that's why? Okay. Like the, the woman in labor and the people in the hospital walking around, listening to the screaming, uh, uh, and, and they're okay. Why are they okay? Oh, she's in labor. No, she's in pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's labor. But what about the pain? Well, you know, in labor, there's pain. So that's it? So, so you're, you're okay with the pain now? Why are you so okay with it? Because you know why. So it still hurts. So here's the point. Here's the really important point. No matter how justified the pain is, it hurts. The hurt is not bad. It's not bad. time of Mashiach when the, the wolf and the wow. you know will be together. Right. Which suggests that before that the fact that the wolf that's the question you had at the beginning, the fact that the lion eats the ga gazelle or the wolf eats the there is something bad you know, there is something evil in it there. It's going to be changed. Be, that will be changed where there is no evil then though, so there is and it shouldn't be. And death will be removed forever. So is death bad? Yes. It is. <coughs> If there is a time when... Where it won't I understand. Be. I understand. But there are two issues. There are two issues. The first is pointless. Things that happen that have no purpose, no justification, no... That we have to get rid of because it will destroy us. If we really think that things happen without a purpose, you, you can't live. No. Okay. Yeah, we'll get that in a second. So the first thing that we have to do before Moshiach comes is we have to get rid of this idea or this suspicion that something can happen for no reason. Because then, then the only solution is suicide. If you're living in a world where things can happen for no reason, then get out. 
once we f figure out nothing happens without a reason, and therefore nothing bad happens, now the question is, what is the purpose of death? What is the purpose of pain? What is the purpose of suffering, of agony, of grief? Huh? What's the purpose of prayer when something bad is happening? Yes. So the second question is a much more delicate question, a much more sensitive question. Somebody is in pain, and it's their own fault. They did stupid things, and they got themselves sick, and now they're in pain. Do you have any compassion for them? No. <laughs> See, exactly. A bit. Uh, well, you know, next time you'll be more careful. Stupid. Come on. <laughs> next time. So we have very little compassion. You knew you, knew you were going to get into trouble. You did it anyway. Okay, next time be more careful. And we have no compassion. And that's not right. Compassion should extend to people who are suffering for a good reason. But they're still suffering. Where did all the compassion go? Well, I understand why they're suffering. So that's it. So here's the problem. After we justify the evil, we can't be content. We can't be content. That's why you really want to know why there's a Holocaust. No, I don't want to know why. Because no matter why, it hurts. I'd still like to know why. Hmm? I'd still like to know why. Yeah. You, can't this look is into, you can't look into a survivor's eyes and say, you know, it was justified. It's all for the good. Really? And you can't tell a parent that lost a child, right, exactly. either. You can't. You can't. There's no way, no how. Of course you can't. But if a person coming out of the Holocaust out of the, says, I understand there's a purpose, wouldn't that be great? That's how, that's how Frankl survived. Right. So, of course, we're, we're not in a position to preach to somebody in, in a lot of pain. And that's you know don't have to go to the Holocaust. Yeah, you can go to anyone. That's yeah, yeah. You go, you go. It's God so forbid, caring. you go to a shiva call, and you say, "It's all for the good." You should. They should throw you out of the house. Would. <laughs> it's so inappropriate. You, you didn't come there to dismiss the pain. You came there to share the pain. That's what. Yeah. That's what a shiva like, call is. Like Baruch Dynamis doesn't make sense to say when someone's in pain. It just doesn't. It's. Unjustifiable. Right, yeah. Like, what are you doing? You're like benching Hashem for something that, like. All right, so, so one second. First of all, you don't no, come to right. somebody else and say, Baruch exactly. Dayanemus. No, only someone on tells your. you, I automatically say it. Only for your own pain, not for somebody else's. But now it makes sense, you see. What are you saying about the tragedy? You're saying God is a true judge. And we don't understand. What, what does that mean? What does it have to do with. What you're saying is, there's a purpose. So what have you eliminated? The randomness, the purposelessness. Because that, that we can't... But that didn't take away the pain. It's not meant to take away the pain. It's meant to take away the insanity. You're not going to go insane because it all has a purpose. And what the purpose is, I don't even need to know. I just need to be sure that there's a purpose, because otherwise I will crack up. So I'm not cracking up because everything has a purpose. Now what do I do with this pain? That's why people have to come, share your pain, take away some of the pain by, by, bur by taking it on. But you don't dismiss the pain because it's all justified. The pain is still real and hard hard to, to, to carry, hard to... So, so we've got to do something about that. So the word, the, the bracha, baruch, dayan, emes, doesn't mean it's okay. It's not okay, but it's not pointless. So don't crack up, 
Let's work on the pain. Let's handle the pain. Now, completely off the topic, I don't know how much time do we have. Huh? 20 minutes. So, briefly, and, and we really shouldn't treat the subject briefly, but when historians look back at the 20th century, they're going to find this fascinating thing from a distance, objectively observing what happened in the 20th century to the Jewish people. They will discover that six million Jews became martyrs, died al Kiddush Hashem. Their, the survivors and their descendants couldn't handle it, stopped believing in God, stopped being frum, and then the grandchildren did tshuva. That's it. That's the 20th century. In other words, in the 20th century, half the Jews became martyrs and the other half became Bali Chiva. That's what happened. It turns out that there's actually a prophecy that before Mashiach comes, Tzaddikim will become Bali Chiva. How does a Tzaddik become a Bali Chiva? the souls of, of people from the past who have achieved the level of tzaddik are still missing this one finishing touch, this one crown, which is called tshuva. So before Mashiach comes, all the souls that were tzaddikim in the past will be born again in order to become bali tshuva. And what will cause them to become Bali Tshuva? The Holocaust. The martyrdom of six million Jews will cause the rest of the Jews to become Bali Tshuva. But in their soul, they were already tzaddikim. Because in their past lives, they've already achieved perfection. But on top of perfection, there are these two crowns. The biggest tzaddik in the world is missing two crowns. One is called tshuva, and the other is called martyrdom. Moshe Rabbeinu, I mean, to say that he was perfect is like an understatement, and yet he was born again as Rabbi Akiva. Primarily to die al Kiddush Hashem, because Moshe's death was a non-event. Nobody saw him die, nobody knows where he's buried. So he lived his life completely godly, but his death was private. Rabbi Akiva's death was massive. It was public, it was Kiddush Hashem. So, before Mashiach comes, which means the 20th century, before Mashiach comes, those tzaddikim who needed the additional crown of martyrdom became martyrs, and those who needed the additional crown of tshuva became bali tshuva. It sounds, huh? sorry. it sounds a little bit like the Muslim religion. I don't the know if they didn't order. choose their martyrdom. I don't know why God needs martyrs. Ah, so now, Six what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just million, so they and everyone. You would think every tzaddik needs it. Even a tzaddik. The perfection. <clears throat> so, what happened? What happened was people became martyrs or people became balei tshuva. And those are beyond perfection, in addition to perfection. So, if you're going to ask, what exactly happened in the Holocaust? Well, take a look. Six million Jews died al Kiddush Hashem. The rest had to do tshuva. That's what happened. So now the question is, really, is that necessary? 
That is the purpose. So it's not purposeless. The question is still, was it really necessary? So after we know what the purpose is, we still don't get it. So what is our question about the Holocaust? People died for nothing? Of course not. That's not even respectful to the people. Six million Jews died for nothing? That's what you think of life? That one Michigan that comes along, six million people have to die because he's crazy? <coughs> of course not. So, you see, it's not enough to know the reason. The only people who are comfortable with six million deaths are Nazis. And thought. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So when we ask the question, we're saying we want to see what he's seeing. Because we're not seeing the full picture. We see what is happening. Bef uh, until recently, the question was not why was there a Holocaust? The question is, what's a Holocaust? We can't even wrap our minds around it. What was that? So we were, we were, we were, we were paralyzed by the question. But even if we know what it was, we still don't understand the necessity for it. So we want to get into God's mind to know why is martyrdom so great? So let's get to the answer before we run out of time. Is evil real? Of course it's real. The, the comparison to darkness, which you're going to find here, darkness is only the absence of light, so it's not really dark. That, that's not, that, that's double talk. What, it's not really dark? The absence of light is not real? So what is this idea that Evil is not really real, it's just the absence of light. What does that mean? The absence of light is not real? <laughs> you turn off the light, it's not really dark? The, the, the comparison of evil to darkness only does one thing, and it's only meant to do one thing, to tell you that you can so easily get the light back. Doesn't mean it's not really dark. It's really dark. The question is, how do you undo darkness? The answer is, <laughs> it's not that hard. Put on the light. Because darkness is only the absence of light. Only. It's the absence of light. So what is the remedy? The remedy is, bring in more light. Don't fight the darkness, because the only thing wrong with darkness, which is real, the darkness is real. What's your problem with it? Let it be dark. No, you don't like darkness. So how do I get rid of it? Don't fight it, turn on the light. So the, the comparison of evil to darkness is only in terms of how to handle it, not whether it is or isn't real. Now, there is a darkness that can be fixed by turning on the light. It's not true of all darkness. In Mitzrayim, for example, during the plague of darkness, turning on the light didn't help. Because that darkness was not the absence of light. That darkness was a creation called darkness. So, there are two things that we do with evil or darkness. There's a certain evil, you simply outlive it. Because it's the absence of light. So if you do what you need to do, if you follow the right path, stay the course, keep going for the light, you'll get there. 
What about the darkness? It'll disappear. It doesn't exist by itself. It's only the absence of. So if you keep bringing in light, there will be no darkness. But then there's another darkness or another evil that we keep talking about that we need to fix. Tikkun olam. What are you fixing? The absence of light? You don't fix the absence of light. So there's a darkness that you can dismiss, and, and you should, because that's its remedy. Dismiss it. And it will go away. But then there's an evil or a darkness you can't dismiss. It's not the absence of light. It's the existence of darkness. And the purpose for its existence is to be transformed into good. But to transform something, it has to be real. So there is a substan substantive evil, and we want it to become good. Because it has an energy that goodness doesn't have. So it's not simply undoing. What is the point? God created a world with evil, and we should get rid of the evil. What was the point? Just to give us a job? You mess up a kitchen just to have the cleaning lady fix, clean it up? Because otherwise she comes there for nothing and you're embarrassed because the kitchen is clean? <laughs> so you mess it up before she gets there? That's ridiculous. The reason evil exists is because it has something powerful, real, and we want it on the side of good. So why did God create evil? Why did God create good? There is something in good and there is something in evil that serves divine purpose, that serves a divine pleasure. So before we ask why is there evil, we need to ask why is there anything? What are you picking on evil? <laughs> Just because you don't like it? Why do people die? Why are people born? Oh, that you take for granted. Yeah, people get born. Now let's figure out why. <laughs> no. Everything has a purpose, including evil. What, what does purpose mean? Purpose means if you use it correctly, you can extract something positive and valuable from it. And that's true of evil. Evil has a power that we're we're jealous. Good people are jealous of evil people. Because, because there's something about evil that goodness doesn't have. Like the insanity of it. <laughs> Not to justify, but somehow, sometimes you feel like you know these terrorists who blow themselves up? What is it? Aside, aside from drugs, they're all drugged. But if it wasn't drugs, that kind of devotion, that kind of commitment, that over-the-top commitment to something... What if you think that's horrible and you don't envy them? What's horrible? That these people are so evil and it's so sad, but there's no envy or jealousy, I mean. So, sorry, so separate. How do you rationalize that? Separate the cause from the devotion. Of course, their cause is wrong. But look at how devoted they are to the wrong cause. Can you imagine if they suddenly did tshuva with that passion? They would be better than the biggest tzaddik. Because the biggest tzaddik is not insanely good. It's just very good. <laughs> so there's a certain power to evil. And we, we notice it all the time. Even in children. Good kids are good kids. Bad kids? They're geniuses. <laughs> and they use it in all the wrong places. So what drives evil? 
there's a certain energy there that goodness doesn't have. That's why when you do tshuva, you're greater than the tzaddik. Because you've taken that energy that sin has. Hmm? Transformed it? Yes. If you could turn that into good, you're more than good. You're uber good. <laughs> so, let me ask you a question. There was Hitler. Who is, who is the equal and opposite to Hitler? He was, he was like infinitely evil. So who's infinitely good? Right, we, it's hard to find an example. But, but in today's world, in the 20th century, who was Hitler's opposite? Nobody. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? We haven't gotten over it because we don't have an equal and opposite. It's still like mind-numbing. How can you be that bad? But how can that create ple pleasure in a show? <laughs> if you transform it. Right. But so it sounds pretty evil it be to like transform. transform like, what do you need? that level of evil Horror. to be transformed. Uh, no, you need that level of energy. The evil you do, you do away with. You take that energy away from the evil. That's like Yaakov stealing the brachas from Esau. <laughs> Those brachas? Oh, no. Evil is not going to get that. So even what evil already has, steal it away. Get it transferred. Move it to the side of good. That's called tikkun olam. So just being good is not good enough. So when we say God created the world out of goodness, no, that's not good enough. That's true, yeah, right. So, so now there's good and there's evil. That's not good enough. The evil exists because there's something there that needs to become holy. And it's our job to face the evil, engage the evil, and, and steal that goodness out of it. Is that true? Yeah. Does it look like evil to Hashem or only God? Yeah. Yeah more than we want, he wants that energy back from the evil. So in many places, like if you see, God is complaining. Why do you worship idols? Why do you run after them? They're nothing. You know what he's saying? You hear what he's saying? Complaining that we're not worshiping him. Worshiping him. Meaning, so we, the conventional understanding here, God is saying, why are you so stupid? Why are you being stupid? Where are you running after them? They're useless. I'll help you. They can't help you, right? So God is complaining about our stupidity. No, no. The energy that people had for idol worship, God was so jealous. Look at the passion you have for that for the for the Avedizar. I want that passion. So when Eliyahu said, <clears throat> if you're gonna worship Baal, worship Baal. If not, worship God. Make a choice. Stop jumping around from both. That, that's what it was? You, you know, pick one or the other. That's what he was saying. If you really believe in Baal, so go. Oh, he wasn't saying that. He was saying, where is your passion? <clears throat> you 
Not if you believe in God, so worship God. No, if you believe in God, give him the passion you have for Baal. Because it's a different passion for some reason. There's a passion in sinning that you don't find in mitzvahs. Even in the biggest tzaddik. So the only way to access that passion is... If Through it's, evil? Yeah, like, like a balchuba, like, do that. Mm -hmm. So, she should make us all balchubas. Should we all sing now and then... Yeah. That, 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 like, yeah. But there's an idea no one thought of. What do you say? It's like, should we sin? Uh, <laughs> too late. I've already <laughs> sinned, and I didn't even know how good I was being. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There's such purpose to that sin. So it's like, you know, the, 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 the analogy that when we're connected to God with a rope, and if you sin, you sever the rope. If you do tshuva, it's, it's tighter. It's tighter. It's closer. Right. And the same thing with you throw the ball against a wall, when it hits the wall, it gets power. It get, yeah, right. it is energized. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for some reason, the rebound has a power that, that the straightforward original doesn't have. Yeah, but martyrdom takes it to a whole different level. I mean, that's so, there's, so there's a song, uh, an old Moroccan song, where it says, uh, it asks God, Please help me love my enemy to the degree that I hated him. In other words, I don't want to just stop hating him. Because then what was the point? I want, to love him. I want my love for him to be as intense as my hate. Because hate is more intense. Because but if I can get... Why? Just the way it is, if I made it, bad is just stronger. I have to say, I hear all the time that we say the, the Hosea B'Tshuva is like, and I'm, we are Hosea B'Tshuva is, is greater than because there is access to that. And it never makes sense to me, like how th that can be understood. I mean, again, like that stronger energy, but isn't it greater to, to never touch that energy actually right, in the eyes of Hashem? How can, can okay, you're, you're you're born without, so you, you, you have it. But in what you're saying, it seems that Let we should almost educate our kids to, to get say. out to sin okay. so that they have come that, so that come pleasure, come that greater pleasure passion. in Hashem. Why? You don't think there's nothing good under the sun. You don't recognize the evil you already have. You so let me, already. let me explain. This is a very, very good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Why, if you say, I'm going to sin because I can always do tshuva, then you can't do tshuva. Why? Because you already do it for the good. So there, there are many explanations. Like you can't, you can't use. Right. One of the reasons is, if you're sinning because you can do tshuva, then you're not really sinning. The passion for the sin is not. Not there. No. <laughs> Like it's more but isn't it greater? The same thing with today's Bali Tshuva. Isn't it Anybody who was not raised with Yiddishkeit and finds Yiddishkeit is a Bal Tshuva. Not really. Why? Because you didn't sin with passion. You didn't know you were sinning. That's right. So, we so that passion for sin wasn't there. So Bal Tshuva is only if you were from, not from, from? No. <laughs> the only time you have a real passion for sin is when you're from. <laughs> right? The passion overcomes everything you believe and everything you're committed to. But if you just didn't know, where's the passion? So really, a from kid who sees a non-kosher candy and says, mm, that's tshuva. That's tshuva. You don't have to do the worst sins in the world and then regret it. The rejection of evil is tshuva. So doing mitzvahs is a tzaddik, not doing a sin is a bal tshuva. Now, how tempting was that sin determines how, how big a, a bal tshuva you are. The greater the passion, and there's always a passion, right? A non-kosher candy, it's appealing. You say no, 
you've salvaged that passion. So the real Bautshuva is a person who sins with passion, not a person who sins unintentionally. So of course, a person who sins unintentionally will correct his ways and become good. Fine. But the reason for evil to exist has not yet been justified. <laughs> the real justification is the, the incredible passion that sin has. Not the absence of light. That's not passion. That, e that darkness, that's easy. Turn on the light. But what about the passion for evil? Turn on the light? Not going to work. Because the light doesn't have that degree of passion to it. But where does passion for goodness come from? Well, Clay Sanefesh is passion for goodness. Hmm? I said Clay Sanefesh is passion for goodness. It's the mm. ultimate of good. They want to be connected. Yeah, yeah. So the person who blows himself up is having clay yeah. sanefesh. <laughs> yeah, but he wants to take others with him. <laughs> right, but that's, that's, that's even more passion. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's, that's what brings them there. Yeah. So the purpose of evil, which is very real, is that it has an energy like, uh, like the energy of a... Of a what is it called? OD? Oppositional defiant? Mm -hmm. that, is such an that is such a powerful energy. That, that rebellion energy. That and that's why, in a sense, the Zebu created a rebellion. Not let's all be nice. But that's what she said. She said the Rebbe was the opposition to Hitler and Russia. Well, the Fede Dike Rebbe in his time, Absolutely. like insanely good? Yeah, because he did do the insane. He did do what's the unexpected there ever. And he got his chassidim to do yes, it. he did, and his chassidists. But, but he was fighting he Stalin fight. more than he was fighting Hitler. <clears throat> but yeah, in order to win against passionate evil, you have to have passionate good, not just natural good. Huh? Where does the passion come from? From the evil. evil? The, the evil provokes you to that kind of... And that's using the evil for good. That's like you get into a big fight with your husband. Nasty, nasty, painful, ugly. And then you make up. And it's better than before. Why is it better? Why not just back to normal? You can't go back to normal once you felt that intense hatred. Normal, you'll never be normal again. You will either be better or you're going to be worse. How do you get better than before? The, the, the intensity of the hatred intensifies the love. An intensity that love does not naturally have. So the person who loves God is jealous of the people who hate him. Because when you hate, it is so much more passionate. What do, what do us normal people do? <laughs> like, we're not haters. How do you approach something like this? We do it very, very, very often, by the way. Whenever there's a tragedy, what do we do? More light. Right? A young girl passes away, we start a mifza. Every girl should light candles for her. That's insane. 
it's insanely good because it's a reaction to an insanely bad. So we're doing it all the time. You know, if, if, if only the rest of the world would do that. So are you saying that the essential energy of evil is more powerful than the essential energy of good? Yes. Yeah. So aren't we all kind of raised to believe that the essential energy of good is better than the essential energy of evil? Better. And it's isn't stronger. this sort of like, doesn't the no. world at large all believe that? Yes, it is better. And that's why the energy that the evil has doesn't belong there. It belongs here. But no, it has more. Better. I mean, stronger. Like, no. Aren't we raised to believe that the energy of good is stronger than the energy of bad? Like, it's but so you're saying it's Conven not really Yes, that's a good point. Conventionally, light Conventionally. is stronger than darkness. Right. But not the darkness that is pure evil. The struggle between good and evil is, in a sense, unbalanced in the favor of evil. Because we live in a world that is more dark than light. This is, this is the lowest of all worlds. So if you just look at good and bad, right and wrong, pleasure and pain, uh, there's more wrong, there's more pain, there's more evil. That's the nature of this world. This is not Atsilus, right? The question is, what power exists that can reverse that? and turn this world into the best of all worlds. Which is, right, that's the whole purpose. The lowest world will become the main dwelling place for God. See, there's your answer. Godliness is, is the answer. Good and evil, that's the battle. Where's, where's the solution? In other words, good will not win over evil. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Godliness will turn the evil into good. But if you just leave good and evil fighting, they'll fight forever and the evil will basically win out. So the lowest of all worlds means a world in which by its own, on its own course, it'll never be good. That's what makes it the lowest of all worlds. So the existence of the food chain, animals eat animals and, and, and things destroy each other, uh, metal rusts away, flowers die when the season ends. That whole process, which makes this the lowest of all worlds, that has to be changed. And what changes it really is not choosing the good. Because no matter how much good you choose, the evil is more. The solution is to bring in something much greater than good and evil. And that is godliness. Good is good. It's not godly unless you bring God into the picture. So good people are not the solution. And that's why the non-Jew who is good is not really solving any problem unless he's doing it for a godly purpose. Unless he brings God into his goodness, he's not the righteous Gentile. He's just a nice guy. What do you mean by bringing godliness in? That you do good because it serves a godly purpose, not because it's better than evil. You know, I have a choice. I can either be good or bad, and good is nicer. That doesn't solve anything. Because God said so? That's why? Not because he said so. Because of his purpose. What does he need he out of this? What his purpose was. Right. So it's not just doing what he wants. 
doing what he needs. You're serving him, not just obeying. There's a huge difference. Now, of course, you, you serve him obediently, obviously. You're going to tell him what to want. But, but the obedience is not the accomplishment. That's just a method, a manner. The accomplishment is you, you created what he needed you to create. You served him. Because we say it's not the absence of good, it's yeah. the actual... So, so let's go back to the Gemara. What was that? The text... Um, 131, Which is it? 131. 31? Yeah. Yes. So you see what it says? Where do we learn that you should thank God for bad things that happen? Because it says, Bechol me'oidecha. And me'oid comes from the word mida. Hmm? Look what it says. Whatever measure he meets out to you, be exceedingly, exceedingly grateful to him. What, what, what is this? Getting a little emotional here. <laughs> what? Exceedingly, exceedingly. Is that, is that hyperbole? Very, very. So the, so the Gemara says on the Medrash, on Friday, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. All the other days it says good. God saw the light and it was good. But on Friday... God saw everything he had made, and it was very good. So the measure says, What's, what does very good mean? Good is good. What's very good? So the measure says, good is the Yetzir Toiv. God saw that it was Toiv. Well, that's the Yetzir Toiv. Very good, that's the Yetzir Har. Isn't that a strange statement? Because when you take the energy of the Eight Sahara and make it good, it's not just good, it's very good. So what, what does it mean? God created the, and it was very good. It was very good means there's, that's the beginning of history, not the conclusion. So it's not like, oh, it's very good, now we can retire and go back to sleep. No, now we have a world ready to be redeemed, elevated, fixed. Why? Because there's a Yetzirah. And that energy, that Eitz Hadas, we got to get that. We got to get that. And then the lowest world, the one that has the Yetzirah, comes out on top. Because in the world of Atsilus, you don't have the passion for godliness that a Balchuva on earth has. Because in Atsilus, there's no pushback. So, is evil real? Evil is. It seems like it's more real than good. That's, that's right. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And that's why we ask, why is there evil? We don't ask, why is there good? Because it's just good. There's nothing special. We ask about evil because there's something special there. And it doesn't belong there. There's something crazy there. I'm yeah. not that special. I think it's yeah. always but crazy has an energy that, it's insane. <laughs> right? That's what it is. And insanity has more energy than sanity. People who go crazy have more strength than a, than a normal human being, right? Maniacal energy. Well, why don't we have that? Why do you have to be maniacal? <laughs> why do you have to be a maniac to have that kind of energy? 
So what's our job? To take a strength from evil and channel it? Yes. I, so we're all going to go weird tonight. Where are we going? Like, what are you saying? Go no, to the evil No, he's not saying to be bad. He's not saying to go do the bad. He's saying take that. No, he's saying I'll tell you what crazy, right? I'll tell you what crazy. I don't need to go into the evil. How do you tap into that evil passion? I'll tell you what crazy good means. Besides doing sin. That's what she's asking. Crazy good means the Rebbe sitting by a Fabrengen in, 19, in 1960, 60, right? Everybody is still bleeding from the Holocaust. And the Rebbe says, we're going to change the world. Come on. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. Talk normal. What are you saying? Like everybody else said, we are going to rebuild ourselves. We are going to get back to what we once had. That's normal. And they accomplished it. All the other Chassidish groups. Their, their cities were destroyed. Their, their people were killed out. And now they're back. Some and they have... Yeah. But you know, it was a natural process also. Even in the good days, they kind of merged. Yeah. And, yeah. So now they have these huge centers with magnificent buildings and huge yeshivas with thousands of kids. And... Back to normal. The Rebbe said, I don't want to go back to normal. What's, what's normal? The world wasn't created to be normal. If you want normal, Atzillus. That's normal. There's God, there's nothing besides God, everything's good. God wasn't content with that. God created an abnormal world. So what are you going to make of it? Normal? In an abnormal world, you have to have an abnormal amount of godliness. So really, without noticing, we're all insane. We're all insane. What, shlichus is not an insanity? It's pure insanity. You take a young, inexperienced couple, send them into a community that does not agree with them on anything. That's insane. And you think the couple is going to come out on top? What are, what are you thinking? And guess what? <laughs> they, they come out on top. It's You get a little kid to go on Miftsayim. It's insane. And you know how we know that it's insane? Because when the Rebbe started, everybody said, that's insane. The Rebbe said, all uh, right. What's your point? <laughs> yeah, it's insane. W what do you expect? Isn't that why we're here? <clears throat> so... Do you, do you have to really be cuckoo? No. We are, we're pretty insane as it is. It's really like, you stop and think about it. A person gets married and is loyal to the marriage. That's insane. No? No? <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> that was being the monogamous uh -huh. being monogamous is insane it's an insane godliness what are you thinking? that's not normal by all standards. So maybe in the olden days, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't imagine not being loyal to your, to your marriage. Today you can't imagine? Most of the people you know are not loyal to their marriage. Because to be loyal is insane. So the question is this. How normal can our insanity become? Mm -hmm. 
people look at Chabad, you're insane. We look at it and, what? Well, what are we doing? What's insane? Go on shlichus? Yeah, well, what else are you going to do? <laughs> to us, the insanity has become sane. And the Rebbe didn't like that. So every time we got comfortable with a mitzvah, he, he added a new one. <laughs> oh, you're getting too comfortable. You're becoming way too sane. Now go and reach out to non-Jews. Whoa, 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 that's insane. Uh-huh. Yep. Totally insane. Now bring Mashiach. <laughs> I should bring Mashiach. Yes. But that's insane. Uh-huh. Yep. And, and what motivates this? The darkness. The evil. Which you created. God. I'm just reading over here that evil is the essence of God. I think I read that correctly. Who's it quoting? Um, uh, the Rambam. He concludes by saying, that no matter how we justify evil, we should never get comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. It ends on kind of a moralistic, we will never accept evil and we will challenge God and we will... We don't challenge God, that's, that's, that's senseless. The argument, the reason we challenge God is because he taught us to do that. No. That's, that's kind of a strange philosophy of believing in God and believing in yourself equally. My sense of justice does not allow me to let God get away with evil. That's a God complex or something. The thing that we never get comfortable with is not the evil and the injustice, the pain, the justified, necessary pain we should never get comfortable with. Because God is not comfortable with it. It's easy to get upset when you think there's an injustice. Even children complain, oh, that's not fair. You don't have to have any intelligence or any goodness to complain about an injustice. The real goodness is, it is just, Baruch Dayan Emes. Now what can I do to take away your pain? You don't stop being sympathetic once you know that there's a purpose. Why? Because God is that way. He certainly has a purpose. And he knows what he's doing and the pain bothers him. That's why he's looking forward to Mashiach. Not only to bring justice, to end the justified pain. So why didn't, why didn't Aaron say that? Why didn't Aaron make that statement? There are many, many different approaches to it. Very few people notice that Aaron's silence meant he didn't say Baruch Dayanemes, which is what you're supposed to say. So it's not just he didn't complain, not he didn't rebel, he didn't even say Baruch Dayanemes. So that's for one of two reasons. Either because there are some tragedies that you can't, you can't say anything. An old man passes away peacefully in his bed, you say, Baruch Dayanemes. But when a tragedy is overwhelming, it doesn't help to say Baruch Dayanemes, right? So it's, wor words do not work. Any words. Does God need to hear it? I guess in the sense that the Torah says that his silence was perfect, it means that's what God wanted. 
He didn't want him to say anything. Had he said anything, it would have made it worse. So either the pain was too big for words, or it wasn't necessary. To say everything happens for a purpose, Aaron didn't need to say that. There was never a question. What was the question? Another explanation that is given is they, they did it on purpose. They died from their own ecstasy. What, 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 why are you blaming God? The question for Aaron was, did they do right or did they make a mistake? The question wasn't why they died. They wanted to die. The question is, is that right? So then God says, uh, no, that's not right. And don't ever do that again. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was wonderful. It's spiritual. Don't do that. From now on, it's forbidden. So when they did it, they were, they were complete tzaddikim because there hadn't been a commandment against it. The first time that God said, do not die from ecstasy, was after they died. So it's similar to the Akedah. What was the Akedah? God says, send your son back to heaven. He's completely righteous. That was such good news. So people say, how come he, he complained about Sodom and, and defended them and argued in their favor? He didn't, ar no argument to defend his son? Ever had that question? There was nothing to defend. God wasn't punishing Yitzchak. He was saying he's purely righteous and he belongs in heaven. Well, that's, what could be better than that? The greatness of Avraham was that he wasn't jealous. Why does he get to go to heaven? What, what's wrong with me? That was the first time that God made it known that going to heaven was not a good thing. Because before that, everybody thought, the sooner you can get to heaven, the better. Like human sacrifice. So God said, no. I don't need you in heaven. I need you on earth. So no more human sacrifices. Unless I want them. Huh? Unless I dictated that I wanted them. Unless you can't serve. Unless you can't work. But if you can serve, don't, yes. don't quit. So that left open the possibility, maybe dying from divine ecstasy is serving him. So, of course, no human sacrifice. But to die from the pleasure of godliness? That sounds okay. So by the sons of Aaron, God said, no, I don't want that either. So don't do that again. But when they did it, there was no, there was no prohibition. They weren't so violating why anything. Why does he want people to die? Okay, this is I don't get it. People we die. Can, we can love him. No, no. We can love him it's not, and it's not people and die, die for Kiddush Hashem. That's what it is. When no. someone's dying al Kiddush Hashem, it's dying for him. What that because means, no. what that means is you can die like, Avra, like Mesha died. Everybody's going to die. So you can die like a non-event or even your death can be serving him making a Kiddush Hashem. So it's not they died for the Kiddush Hashem. They died, and even their death brought a Kiddush Hashem. So it's like saying, if, if they hadn't died for Kiddush Hashem, they would have lived more. N not necessarily. They would have died without a Kiddush Hashem. Huh? All the six million, you said, was martyrdom. Was it for that? Everybody dies when their time comes. But some deaths are embarrassing, uh, painful. Some deaths are a little more dignified, a little more elegant, a little more... You know? So the question is not why did they die. The question is how did they die? Because death 
is part of nature. But it can happen in so many different ways. So uh, Moshe Rabbeinu died, but it, his death didn't do anything for the world. Rabbi Akiva died. He was 120, by the way, not like he, <laughs> he died before his time or something. But his death is still being spoken of today. It's one of the inspiring parts of the davening on Yom Kippur. <clears throat> so it's not like he, he really was going to live a much longer life, but he was killed al Kiddush Hashem. Everyone's death is predetermined at birth. The question is, did your death accomplish something or did it just end your life? So martyrdom means your death was a significant event. Otherwise, you die and there's no, no significant event. That's, th those are the options. But not like, well, if you don't die, you'll live forever. You don't live forever. So, there are people whose lives are magnificent, but their death was just a death. There are people whose lives were magnificent, and even their death was magnificent. Like Shimshon said, I'm about to die, but can't I die accomplishing something? Can't my death also bring a blessing to the Jews? Like, take all these guys with me? <laughs> that. So everybody actually prays that their death be productive, significant, inspire somebody, you know, have somebody say cottage for me, <laughs> something. Just gone, that's it? That's Over and done with? E even death has a value. Like, how many people become good because the parent passed away? And they were never so sensitive and they were never so good, but now that the parent passed away, all of a sudden they want to do the right thing. And would he prefer this? Would he have preferred that? You never cared what your father wanted when he was alive. So, conclusion. Evil is real, and it is the most exciting motivational force in the universe. Look at how every cause, right? Every crusade, pardon the expression, every, every rebellion was a reaction to evil. Of course, it turned out to be evil too, but that's, that's besides the point. <laughs> For every rebellion, you have to have a rebellion to undo the evil of the rebellion. But the rebellion was against an evil, and people gave their lives for it, rightfully or wrong. But look at the motivation, look at the power that this thing has. In fact, people are worried, what's going to be when Mashiach comes? What's the passion going to be? Everything will just be good. It sounds boring. Huh? Yeah. We can, we can use a little boring for, for a change. Right. You have the option. Serenity or passion. A passionate serenity. <laughs> An intense calm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's that's exactly what we're looking for. An intense goodness, not a boring goodness. A passionate marriage, not a functional marriage. <laughs> so the coming of Mashiach is not, okay, we'll settle down and things will be okay forever. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. 
it certainly doesn't justify all the pain of the past. What? All of that so that we can just go back to normal? No. It's got to be much better than normal because it's been much worse than normal. The ultimate purpose is the insane pleasure of our relationship. And what makes it insane? The transformation of evil into good. The world's evil, everything. Just like absence makes the heart grow fonder. Why? So you can say, absence only reminds you of what you're missing. Because when, when your husband is home, you don't realize how much you need him, how much. But when he goes away, you realize. No, that doesn't make you fonder. That just makes you realize how fond you are. But absence does more than that. It makes the heart grow fonder because the absence has a power that presence doesn't have. When in Russia, you were not allowed to put on tefillin, how much passion people put into their tefillin? <clears throat> the insane passion of communism to destroy Judaism. It was insane. They were threatened by an old man who, who, who spoke Hebrew. What is your threat? You're the superpower of the world. You've got America intimidated, but you're afraid of an old guy because he used a Hebrew word? What is this insanity? What do you care of the Jews in your country speak Hebrew, read Hebrew, teach their kid olive bays? Drove them crazy. They sent spies and they built prisons and they met tortured people. What is your problem? And that kind of insanity was the, the Rebbe's reaction to, oh, are we going to put on tefillin? Wow, are we going to teach our kids olive bays? Underground, but insanely. And he won. He was more insane. It was crazier than crazy. You see this clip about this guy, the uh, Refusenik? What's, what's his name? The famous Refusenik from Mendel, Mendelevich. You didn't see the clip? The whole story of how he went on a, on a hunger strike and... Anyway, he beat the system, really. And he ends the whole story <clears throat> when he got out of jail <clears throat> because they couldn't break him. They didn't know how to handle him because he was insane. <laughs> they put him on a plane to Israel. The communists put him on a plane to Israel. He said, look what happened. You told me I will never leave Russia. Because he wanted to get out. And they said, never. You're never going to get out of here. In the end, they paid his ticket to Israel. They put him on the plane. Who won? I don't know. Is there, there something else that we're given that can create that energy without the hardship? No. Because if there was, if there was another way to do it, then why would God do it this way? Yeah. That's a question we have no answer for. Mm -hmm. We understand the system now. But God is infinite. Could have picked any system. Why this one? 
That's what Mashiach is going to have to explain. So after all the explanation, that there's a power to evil because it is rebellious, because it is anti-God, it's even stronger than goodness. But okay, fine. Who created that? Who says evil has to have more power? I don't know, but the fact is it does. And the fact is, we have to get that power back. And once we get it back, we'll ask God why he set it up this way and not some other way. Because no matter which way he set it up, we would always ask, why this way? <laughs> why not the other way? So God actually created evil? Or is it the absence of God that creates evil? That's the question. See, there's a difference between, he starts off with this. There's a difference between absence and opposite. Okay. Let's take a look at that. Okay. Where does... Yeah, right, right, not just the absence. Where, where is that? Right at the beginning somewhere, isn't it? When it says, like, the absence of light is darkness. Right. But it's not. It's, so if you say that, then, then you're saying that God is not in the evil, but he is in the evil, so you can't use that analogy. Because he created evil, so if he created it, then he's in it. Right, so the analogy is really referring to a lesser evil, which is only the absence of light. So there are two levels. Say it again, what are the two levels? One is an evil that is only the absence of light, and the other one is the creation of evil that is the opposite, not the absence. So is there, is there one that's the absence of light? There is one that has no godliness in it? Because, yeah. That has no substance to it. It's simply the absence. And that's easy to fix. Bring in the light. But isn't there always justice though, in the end? Doesn't everything have to be like, I'm saying, let's say evil between two people. I'm saying not evil, let's, not, I'm saying someone does something to someone else. Evil, I always thought goodness prevails in the end. If yeah. If evil stronger. Actually, godliness prevails in the end, not goodness. But, but isn't there justice in the world always, in the end? Like, everything has to come around? Yeah. Yeah. God's yeah so, so is there if someone takes something from someone else he steals is there a reward has a godliness and say don't you get back what, what belongs to you so the question is are you rewarded for your suffering no if does it all if, pay if, you, if things work if everything works out in the end you don't you know if there's a god that you know that evil doesn't win if there's a God that does just me in. Right, so godliness will succeed and the power of evil will be transformed or redeemed. The question is, for those who invested and went through the suffering, is there some uh, reward? Is there some... Redeeming. Huh? What's the balance of that? Like you went to war. Compensation? Yeah, compensation. You went to war and you won. That's it. Okay, now you can go home. Or is there some kind of medal, <laughs> some kind of compensation? What balances the pain that you experienced? So that's why... The Torah says that when Mashiach comes, we will thank God for the pain, which means there'll be some kind of benefit or compensation or reward. It it won't it won't it won't just be ignored. So so what is it we need to see besides the victory? See, the victory is not yet enough. The question is, why, would, why did there have to be this war? I mean, of course, it's good. We won. Great. Why was there a war? Why was this whole thing necessary? That is the reward or the compensation. So, of course, there'll be the pleasure of victory. But there's got to be more than that. 
There will be more than that. Yeah, but that's not enough. So what could possibly compensate? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. That's the compensation. Not the victory. Victory is necessary. Victory is the project. That's not compensation. Yeah, so it's almost that like. That it's all, right. So it's almost like your soldiers come home after winning the battle. So that's it, they come home, you won the battle, okay, we can all go to sleep now. The, the homecoming, the hero worship, now you're something so special. If that doesn't happen, like when we're seeing this in the, in the headlines, soldiers come back from war and they need all sorts of therapy because they're, they're they're traumatized. They're that didn't happen after World War I or after World War II. Nobody came back traumatized. They came back heroes. They didn't need any therapy. Or maybe they needed therapy because it went to their head and they thought they were, they were greater than they were. But no, nobody came back feeling horrible because they were greeted like heroes treated like heroes, not just victors. It's not enough to be victorious. So when Mashiach comes, it will be, we won. Of course we won. You had to win. What else? What will this do to our relationship with God? That we uh, are waiting to see. You know, somebody says, what, what happens? A woman is trying to get married year after year, and it's not happening, and it's painful, and it's horrible. It, 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 it's to the brink of suicide. And then they get married. Where does all that pain go? You ask the, the you ask the kala. So so what about all the so what about all the pain? You know what she says? What pain? It's like it's gone. It disappears. They never say, "Wow, those were painful years." Never heard a kala say that. It's like everybody talks about the the shidduch crisis. You're engaged. Crisis over. <laughs> There's no crisis. It never happened. There was never any pain. That's the darkness that is the absence of light. Once you bring in the light, what darkness? What are you talking about? It's not like Minnesota. <laughs> we go through a miserable winter and we make all sorts of vows. We'll never, never, that's it. I'm getting out of here. And then the summer comes and I'm like, what? The place is beautiful. <laughs> what winter? It snows here? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What am, I'm looking for that quote where it says that evil is not the absence, it's the opposite. Where is that? Maybe 18? Text 18? No, it's, it's a short statement from Ramban, I think. Uh, come on. Yes, so in text of 18, the bad are simply absences, for God has made nature of the material state. And it's, it's 21. 
There we go. Look at what it says here. Darkness is not the opposite of light, it is only the absence of light. For I have never observed two opposite entities of which one is transformed to become the other perfectly. So when I see a dark space become illuminated, I know that darkness is not the opposite of light, only its absence. <clears throat> what is the opposite of love? Oh no. Um, like carelessness, like like don't even care at all, like indifference. indifference. Is that not just the absence of love? What do you mean? Indifference means I don't love. So is that the opposite of love or just no love? No. Hmm? It's just the absence. How about hate? Is hate the opposite of love? Hate is so passionate that it can be transformed into love. You only hate the ones you love. Yeah, right? Something exactly. like that. The, ops, the, the opposite of love is self-love. No? What, what is the opposite of love? What is the opposite of my loving you? Come on. Loving myself. <laughs> the real resistance to love is self-love. Why should I love you if I can love myself? Can't you love both at the same time? You can. But to the degree that I love myself, to that degree I don't love you. Maybe self obsession, but not self love. Like what 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 is the opposite of respect? Self respect. I'm important, not you. So disrespect is more the absence of respect. The real opposite is me. It's like the question, who should I love? Not is there love. Is there love or is there not love? That's just absence. The opposite to loving you is loving me. <laughs> Come on, you hear this all the time. You don't really love me. Well, you don't really love me. <laughs> Why should I give you love? You're not giving me any love. So the real, ob the real obstruction, the real resistance to loving you is, hey, what about me? I should love you. You love me first. So what is the opposite of belief in God? No belief? Believe in humanity. <laughs> That's why I am God. You should have no other God. What's, what's another God? You should worship me. Don't worship... <laughs> so the opposite of Emuna in God is Emuna in me. When you become more important. Mm -hmm. But there could also be lack of, not necessarily, not necessarily is it always opposite. You mean like, I don't worship anything? But if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. There's no such thing as don't love yourself. There's no such possibility. <laughs> like lower respect. No self-respect no. No self means you're too busy with yourself. Mm. <laughs> no self-respect means I don't respect myself, I need respect. Well, yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. If I need respect, I'm too busy to respect you. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm busy with myself. Either because... I respect myself more than you, or I need respect more than you. 
I got the problem, not you. But it's always me is the, is the resistance. So what about somebody who worships nothing? Okay, that's the op- absence of worship. It's not another God. It's no God. The, the darkness that you mentioned, the darkness that hasn't existed, that is not just the absence of, is, is the opposite. Is that negative that transformed into a positive becomes? Mm-hmm. Right? So there is a darkness that would be the opposite of light. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's making an important distinction that there's a difference between something being absent or something being the opposite. Um, okay. When it comes to evil, there's both. Is evil godliness or is it the absence of godliness? It's both. There is an evil that is simply senseless. Like sometimes your Yetzirah is just pointless. And then the only solution necessary is get busy. You're lazy. What's the solution? Go do something. But then there is a, a creation of evil that makes this world the lowest of all worlds, and that's real. And that's worth redeeming or or fixing or ransoming back, bring it back to godliness. It's not godly. It's created to serve the energy a the energy. energy it has is godly. What do you mean it's godly? Obviously God God created it. <clears throat> it doesn't exist by itself. It exists because God created it. Like everything else. Like everything else. But the amount of energy God gave it is enviable. So why did he give it more energy? Why did he give to that aspect of this world so much more strength? And is, is it the energy of the Tohu that we mentioned? It seems that's what it is. So here's, here's the point. God, God created the world out of, what do we know? God created the world out of, huh? out of a taiva, right? A passion. Now, if God has a passion, then there also has to be an equal opposite passion. No, but it's also something that can't be explained, so it's got to be a little bit insane. Passions Passion is always insane, yeah. Shalom Aleichem. How are you? You know I do a lot of talking, a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects, but that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, time for questions and so on. If you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at nine o'clock. Well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at nine o'clock, a more informal chat, which, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out. Click on the link and join us. Try it. You'll like it.